Welcome to Book Trivia. I'm very delighted today to be here with Di Morrissey to talk about a new novel, Distant Journey. Welcome, Di. Thank you, John. Now, A Distant Journey opens up in America, uh, uh, heading uh, into um, or the suburb next to um, Palm Springs uh, in, I think, as far as I can, I can gather, the 1950s, or the late 50s? Or the late early 50s, 50s yeah. early 60s, yes, yeah. yes. And it's a woman who is um, running from a, a, a bad marriage, or a, um, a, um, I think sort of, there's, a, there's a hint of, of, of violence uh, in, that, in that, and she's escaping and running off with her son into a new life. Um, how did this, did this idea just pop into your head as a, as a beginning well, point? No, actually, it's, um, uh, it's inspired by my late um, uh, ex-mother-in-law, who I absolutely uh, adored. Uh, and it was a really brave thing to do in the early 60s. And she was in I don't know, Oregon or Pennsylvania or somewhere, and it was you know, cold. And she had a, a very unhappy marriage and with an 18-month-old son, um, Peter Morrissey, and no money. She drove across the country and started a new life. In, in Palm Springs, uh, sewing clothes for children. And so uh, it's sort of family folklore where she was just extraordinary. Uh, and it, and I, I like to explore, um, you know, a woman's journey, but also putting people in the situation of being a fish out of water and that kind of different uh, culture because I married an American and even though we think we're very similar, those small things really become quite big. And I was just thinking plus the effect of landscape on the psyche, what would be the furthest place someone from Palm Springs could end up? And I thought, a sheep station in remote Australia. <laughs> so we, we, we get to meet Babs. Uh, she does um, create a, a, a life for herself. And then a knock comes on the door and it's her niece um, running away as well. Yes, 15 years old and she's, she's uh, you know, run away from the you know the stepmother she doesn't like and uh, and so she ends up staying in with uh, with her aunt in Palm Springs and goes to college and so Cindy um, we think is you know set on life's path but as women have a way of doing we fall in love with often the wrong people <laughs> and so it's Cindy that is transported from Palm Springs all the way into the outback of Australia Yes, yes. Well, she she falls in love with the, an Australian uh, that she meets on you know on business and holidays in in Palm Springs, and there's a whirlwind romance. And the next thing, you, impetuously, as in the '60s, remember, she she comes out and marries an Australian with no idea of where she's going, uh, and she finds herself in uh, on on a sheep station in the Riverina, um, and it's such a different culture, landscape, setting, but she's also just, just slowly learned she's married into a family with, you know, some awful secret. And she, the, the you know, Palm Springs, of the, the way you describe it, is, is full of um, film stars and, and the, the famous and the, the rich mm. and the glorious, to, to go from that. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I mean, Palm Springs is an extraordinary place. I've never been there. Uh, look, you do have to go because it's quite, it's quite amazing. Uh, you know, it's just this jewel in the middle of the desert with all of this money pumping water into these emerald lawns and the lawn stops there and the desert starts right next to it. Um, but it was the, because it was only two hours from Hollywood and the movie stars were not allowed to travel more than two hours away to be on call. So this became, and the climate is wonderful. So so they built all these edifices and these amazing homes, which are now preserved because of that period of the 1970s. Um, it was an ex extraordinary architecture and stuff, and uh, it's yeah. And I mean, it's it was it's iconic. So I just thought that would be the the biggest contrast I could possibly I imagine to go from from all of this glitz and, and glamour and piano shaped swimming pools that Frank Sinatra had, and end up uh, you know in a. a, 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 a sort of an Australian sheep station where all the money goes into the property. It does not go on frivolous matters. Yeah. Um, we're celebrating a bit of a, an anniversary with, with you this year, with 25 years uh, in publishing. Uh, publishing yes, novels. yes. Where's it all gone? <laughs> it's an extraordinary... I mean, uh, I mean I'm, I'm very privileged because I get to speak to you um, the, every year. We get to have a yeah. chat and I get a little bit more of the story. This is um, the success story that... that you have um, in Australian publishing 
uh, it's unmatched. I can't see, think of anyone who's had that consistency right No, it's through. been around as long as me. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, um, the, the people can be, like, there's people like Tom Keneally, and, 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 but they're not as consistent. They're not as, uh, they're not on the bestseller lists year after year. This is, this is something which is enviable. Like a lot of writers are sitting along going, how did she do this? How can I emulate what, what Di does? But you've been able to do it. Yeah. It, it looks to looks from my perspective because you come in here and you're you're so together and you present your book so well that it's 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 not a great deal of trouble for you. But there must be there must be times when you're going, but I've got I've got this great run. I can't I can't let this, let this oh, drop. Oh, look! Starting every book is the same as I did with part of the dreaming with the first book. I mean, it's terrifying, and you think, and the more I think really the more you you have some success, you think, oh golly, how did I do that, and can I do it again? Yeah. Um, and so each book starts, you know, in the same nervous wreck. But I've decided that I don't, I just have to do what I've always done and that's right for myself and not be aware of, of that huge audience that's, that's out there and you can't think about trying to please everybody. So you just have to be true to yourself. And really, in some ways, the story kind of writes itself in that, you know, it's, uh, it's inspired by a particular landscape and a, and, a, and, a, and a setting and then the issues around that and the people around that by going and living in the place it kind of you know it, it, it leads me on you know into the story but it's also I've tried to um, tell our stories I mean there's, there's still foreign bits in in my books that have a link in one way or another with Australia but I I came in to publishing through, um, I had been working on television and uh, I'd been living overseas married to a diplomat and lived in foreign countries and then I came back and worked in television and went around Australia and really discovered my own country for the first time and I realised that we should be telling our stories and it was then James Fraser at Pan Macmillan was the, that's what he was thinking that you know we shouldn't be kowtowing to all the foreigners and um, we should be publishing should be really pushing Australian stories and he it's it, luck and timing in life is everything mm. and I had written a couple of pages of something and someone showed it to him a, a, a lady who became a very famous literary agent and James said oh this is what this is what I want it's set in Longreach it's about Australians and and then they said oh you're going to put any foreign bits and I went no it's a story set in Longreach mm. so um, and the timing was right and Australian readers were ready to read our stories a bit you might on the table and the, yeah. you know all of that so it's now it was a bit revolutionary at the time and we didn't know if it would work or not but it, it did and now we have a whole sort of genre in many ways. Well my, my book selling career is, is exactly on, online with your writing career because I remember when your books came out there really wasn't much in the um, in the market especially not getting the, the, the full spread, uh, spread uh, in the magazines and the posters on the bus stops and the side of buses they, they weren't publishing and promoting Australian writing as they as they do now and they in that period uh, of, of consistent bestsellers coming out from Di Morrissey it gave other publishers confidence to actually put their toe in the water uh, and get this yes. great Australian writing and not just turgid um, difficult um, literary ones that that, um, that no one really read uh, but big epic stories about our land and about our, our places. I mean, I, I, I read a lot of people like um, Rachel Treasure and um, Linda Alexander, uh, even Bryce. Um, these people are the, are the writers who came in and yes, you know, yeah. were able to to have this presence in the Australian market because of the successes of of your early novels. Yes, well, it was to you know Pam McMillan, to Ross Gibbon and James Fraser that they saw that. I mean, I think they they also James said also that that I'd worked as a journalist, so I could probably string a few words together, and I'd worked in television. Yeah. So um, either way, they felt that 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 I could cover a couple of, of, of bases. Um, but then once it it, it it took off and. You know, it took it, the first book really did work, but I mean, there's still that ongoing building up and, mm. and, and exposure. Oh, I'm not saying it was easy. Yeah, though, but, no, yeah. Um, and also the getting over the perception. I, I I wanted to fight the perception that I wrote romance novels, mm. so I didn't want to have pretty ladies on horseback or things, and you know, on the, on the covers of, of my books because they were different, uh, and. Um, and also winning over male readers has been a long, an ongoing battle. 
and I now have you know a legion of, 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 of men who uh, you know who write to me and I think one of the touching ones was when I wrote Monsoon which was set partly in, in Vietnam and it touched on the Battle of Long Tan and now when I wrote that see I've followed my instinct as well against the odds quite often um, you know the the it was coming up for the 40th anniversary of the Battle of Long Tan, and no one had ever paid any attention to Long Tan. So when I went there, you know, the rubber plantation, there was no big memorial, it was just, you know, pretty. There was just a, a, a band of fellows that were looking after it. And I wrote about that. Um, and then everybody wanted to go to Vietnam, and a lot of the vets wrote to me. That's been the biggest compliment, that Vietnam vets wrote to me and said, it's like you were with us and um, I'm going back to face the ghosts now. And their wives understood why they had come back so changed. And so, I mean, that was really wonderful. I mean, I'm still out there to entertain, but I do try to, I suppose that's my journalistic background. I still like to weave in some of our, our, our history and like A Distant Journey is also set against the Australia's biggest business, you know, corporate collapse with the, the falling apart of the, uh, the wool stockpile in 91. So, yeah, so I try to weave in all of these issues. I have this, uh, this idea in my head of, um, of, a, of a really burly trucker driving, you know, hours down a highway listening to, to Di Morrissey on the audiobook. Oh, book. it's true. Do you know, but you know what? When I first started, I had a lady say to me, come up to me at, at a function and say, my husband loves your books. He, so he takes them to work with him. And I said, oh, what's he do? And, He's a long distance truck driver. He drives, drives across the Nullarbor. And it's a very straight road, so he sits your book up on the steering <laughs> wheel and he drives all the way across the Nullarbor. So he didn't have audio books. <laughs> so anyway, many years later, I went, oh dear. Anyway, many years later, she did write, so you'll be pleased to know he's he's retired from the truck driving. Now he reads your books in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> That's so much better. Can you imagine? Can you see it? I love that. I can see it. That's yeah, the That's the, yeah, the fear yeah, of it all. So, so, so it's nice to have, you know, fellows come up and say, I never thought I'd read a girly book, but, you know, your books are for everybody, love. So when you're, when you're writing, uh, when you're, you're reading um, non-fiction books about the era that you're writing in, uh, do you ever give yourself time off? Because it, it is, a year is not a very long time to mm. write, a, write a book. Um, and so, you know, you, fit, you hand it in, you start researching and thinking about a, a new area. And so your reading is kind of part of the book process. Do you just ever just stop and just read for pleasure with outside of... Oh, I, yes, I always travel with a book. I mean, even if I'm going to go to the doctors and I don't sit in the reading room and read, in the waiting room and read the old magazines, I always have a, a book in my handbag, whether it is a research book or one for pleasure. But the best time is like the Christmas break yeah. around the pool at the beach on, on, on holidays. Um, I just went through this year the whole... Neapolitan Elena uh, oh, the, the four, one after the other. I saved them all up to read in one big hit. Love them, love them, love them. So they're extraordinary books. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, what what else did you, did you read? Did you read um, uh, other contemporary Australian yes, I, writers? I and, do. I've, I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've just finished The Dry. I thought Jane uh, um, Harper's book was fabulous. So I, I read anything and everything because I'm also running a newspaper now. So I have to review books. I do review yes. too. <laughs> But he could actually have a girlfriend help me out with that. But I mean, that's another opportunity to, to dip into books there, I might n not actually look at. Are there any authors that you um, look at? I mean, it, it, you know, I, I mean, I, I can read authors and be jealous of, of how they, they do things. But are there any authors that you just, with something, if they publish something, you just say, oh, I have to go. An Australian author, you might just have to go and grab grab the latest book. Is there someone you've followed, been following for years? Or? Well, Tim, I think, mm. yes. I've watched Tim's career and, and uh, you know, I, um, when I first met him, I just thought he was very special. Um, and I've just, I've just finished his Island Home. I have, I've got, but I haven't read his uh, the bio, bio autobiography, The Curtain, Boy Behind the Curtain yet. But um, uh, because, you know, my books are very much inspired by landscape and place and Tim's got his place that mm. he's just so made his own. Mm. And it's just, you know, I just stop and... I f he's one person that I stop and reread sentences because I go, that's just wonderful. Yes, yeah. yeah. I'm a big, big fan. Yeah, I was very mm. lucky to have a bit of a chat last... Uh, last he's month. lovely. Yeah, he yeah. was, he was yeah. absolutely amazing. Yeah. Uh, um, it, it, it's... I find at the moment, because there's a, there's a sort of a, um, a, a people's movement happening within, within fiction, 
with um, the rise of, of, of what they call genre. But uh, it's, 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 to me, it's, in my old bookshop, I used to have a section called Popular Fiction. Because why is it popular? Because it sells well and it's, it's, yes. it's, it's a good story. And, and to, to my mind, that's what's, what, what's going on. It's a reaction to um, the exclusivity of, of certain um, prizes uh, and a certain section of the book industry um, that seems not to um, reward writers who are successful. It almost seems like a, it's not allowed. You're channeling Bryce Courtney. Yeah. It was, yes, Bryce, Bryce is big, big oh. Horse. Yes, I think there is. Well, there's always been this argument, and it only happens in Australia. Everyone else has got over it growing up. Uh, but there's this issue between popular and literary fiction that one is possibly considered better than the other, which is ridiculous. So, I mean, uh, uh, you know, books books are like food. You know, there's l- long gourmet dinners and, f- and special food, and then there's fast food, and then there's food that's satisfying, and there's healthy food. I mean. It's everything. And I think whatever stirs your emotions, makes you think, or like people finish reading one of my books, they have to go immediately to the place where it's set. Yeah. Broom owes me heaps. Yeah, oh, they owe you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, yeah, just so, the so I don't know. And I mean, yes, I think, I mean, one of the most hurtful things I think that, that someone ever said about me was my books were, uh, you know, like hairspray just sprayed on sprayed on paper there it is she's whipped out churned is the word churned out another one whereas over the years I've learned skills and a system I have evolved a system and uh, to enable me to do a book each year and and repolish it and repolish it and redraft it to get to the the best stage that the I am proud to let it go go out there. Um, and that I've evolved a system which Pam and Mellon have been very supportive in that I have one editor who only works with me all year. Yeah. So I write one chapter, she gets it. I'm starting the second chapter, she does edits the, 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 the first chapter, it comes back to me. So we keep going through it and then it goes through the copy editor. And So between the three of us, we, in seven months, have redrafted and repolished that book five times times at least mm, so in, this is a system that um that i'm fortunate to have I see a lot of other authors you put blood sweat and tears for sometimes years mm. into a manuscript and there's a potential there but then the editor says you know in chapter three if you'd only done this you've got to rewrite the whole book yeah. you know that's a different process so that is i think that that i my books are there to the best of my ability and and um but I'm able to do them, uh, you know, each year because of this system. Well, anyone who says you turn them out um, hasn't actually attempted to write a book themselves. Yes. That, that's the thing. So many people have opinions about writing. Until you face that empty page and until you've actually got a manuscript that actually works from beginning to end, and yes. don't talk about it. Yes, <laughs> so yeah. Like, but so also the fact that that people are moved to to tears to um, to write to to an author uh, and I always say to people when I meet them they go oh you know, I've always wanted to maybe talk you know write to you and say how much I enjoy your books I'm going please write to an author mm. and say how much your book you've enjoyed the book because you 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 you're not on stage with applause you just don't know yeah, you don't, you're by yourself. A, lo- a lot of the time mm. and for writers and and well for myself it's like a disease you you absolutely can't imagine not doing it and to be able to make your living doing what you love most is you know is is really ab- absolutely you know wonderful so uh, uh, yeah and as you say writing is if you tried to sit down and even just write a letter of family history or anything to express what you really feel and you want to say, it's not easy. No, it's not easy at all. And it's also very hard to write simply. Mm. That's where my journalism training, I think, was really one of the best things I could have had as well, a novelist. Well, that's the thing, is that the opening of uh, Distant Journey is, is um, necessarily lightly sketched, so that you're drawn in, into the story. Yeah, it's very complicated what you're getting across. There's so many different things going on in that first bit. And, you know, anyone starting out as a writer would have all those ideas and try to plonk them all down and just be all over itself. Um, and it's very... I, I find that skill of, of writers, especially writers who have been doing it for a long time, to say so much with so little. 
I, yes. I, I always takes my breath away when I when I see. That's uh, well, again, that's journalism. So that I learned that when I was actually quite a bad journalist when I look back on it because <laughs> I put in lots of description mm. and what, who said what, and and of course the editors, the sub editors, just cut it all out with a blue pencil and they just chopped the bottom off. It was too long. So you and you have to get your audience in the beginning, or it's, you turn the page. You know, you're not. Oh, I'm not interested in reading that. Yeah. So that's all was very good grounding. They didn't have creative writing courses in my day when I started. Well, so, so few of the authors that I meet have done them. That's, no. a, that's the interesting thing. Is the same people doing these creative writing courses, and yet the authors who I get to meet in, in these uh, conversations. So it is. Done it. it is. It's. It is a calling, and it's a disease. Mm. And sometimes I, I worry. You know, I'm asked to, to you know, teach people or, or give talks, and I, I, I actually don't know what, how I do what I do. And I really think we're all kind of given a gift, and mm. my gift is storytelling. You know, some people can sing or paint, and I wish I could do do those. So, and then you know, it's a calling, and once you you, you know, are on the journey, then you you, you hone your skills and your uh, abilities. But essentially, it's really, it's really got to be a very honest thing. You can't say, okay, I'm going to, to write a book like this and have a template. It doesn't work. It's no. just really got to come from your heart and guts and soul and all, the, all those other painful places where that's what it is. Di, it's been absolutely wonderful talking to you. Uh, today, I, I enjoy it every year. We we always cover something we, a, a little bit different. Yes, um, yes, we do. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I look forward to um, many years of of Di Morrissey bestsellers coming out in, perfectly for Christmas. As the bookseller in, in me, I just I can't. I just love the fact that you come out. It was an accident in book one, and then after that, it became kind of a tradition. Yeah, so it, it makes it makes the bookseller's life very easy. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for for publishing for twenty five years, and it, it's oh, an amazing achievement. Thank you, John, and congratulations with Booktopia. It's really just an absolutely wonderful, wonderful thing to see happen in Australia. You're a groundbreaker too. Yay! <laughs> thank you. Dyer's book, A Distant Journey, is available from booktopia.com.au right now as are all of Dyer's books. <laughs>